Well, shalom again. It's Shabbat Austin. Shabbat shalom, yes. We're here in Austin, Texas, on the scene at the, ac- at the scene of the accident where the devil accidentally blessed us, and he was <laughs> trying not to bless us. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it, whoops, yeah. that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Everything works for our good. That's absolutely correct. Yes. Hallelujah. So we are here in Maine, right on the edge of Austin. Mm-hmm. And we are here on purpose because God brought us here. Amen. And we're not leaving until he tells us to leave. That's it's right. Time. And when it's time to leave, then we'll leave. That's right. Hallelujah. Well, we're so thankful to be in his service, mm-hmm. Yahweh's service. And we're going to have a nice teaching this morning. We hope that you will stick around and enjoy it. Yes. And we'll seek really with your heart and your soul to the bottom of the bucket where all the goodies are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a, a story about uh, a missionary that went to the uh, American Indian uh-huh. community. Uh-huh. And uh, they were crying and bemoaning the fact that they couldn't provide for him their usual delicacy they like to provide for guests. Mm. And so uh, finally... One of them said, uh, dig deep, puppy at bottom. That's their delicacy. Interesting. In the stew pot, they had a dog. Oh. And this, it was, (laughs) they said we would like to have had a real dog, but we could only find a chicken to put in there this time. Oh. (laughs) For that. That's when he stopped and <laughs> said, Lord, thank you for the chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they were disappointed they couldn't give him their specialty. Yeah. He was very thankful for that. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to have some specialties from God, and God says, dig deep gold at the bottom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we're going to try to seek out some of that gold today as we are, are teaching his word. Amen. Our Father who is in the heaven, we thank you for every opportunity we get to teach people your word. We ask you, Lord, that you would put your words in our hearts and in our minds, in our souls, and draw forth those things that you want to bring forth, your delicacies, your tender mercies, your love, and pour it out upon us as we study so that we can see truly we have been in the presence of Almighty Yahweh. So be with us this morning as we study and help us to really get to the bottom of the word that you have given us for today. Everybody say it. Lord, I'm hungry. Lord, I'm hungry. I ask you to feed me. I ask you to feed me. And I'm thirsty, Lord. And I'm thirsty, Lord. Give us living water to drink. Give us living water to drink. And we will pour it out upon others as we see them. And we will pour it out upon others as we see them. To serve you. Hallelujah. To serve you. Hallelujah. We give our praise and prayers and thanks unto Almighty God and Yeshua, His Son. We give our praise and thanks to Almighty God and Yeshua, His Son. Amen. Amen. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. <laughs> Amen. Baruch Yeshua HaMashiach. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, thank you, Lord. And we're going to get into our study this morning. Please be seated if you're able. And if you're not, well, just do whatever you can do. <laughs> if you're lying down, stay there. It's fine. It's Shabbat. <laughs> <laughs> you may be seated. How many of you know that when a part of your body is achy and sore, Mm -hmm. the rest of the whole body is in empathy with that sore, achy part? And you can't hardly think about anything else when you're in that situation. Well, you are the body of Almighty God. And he has trouble thinking of anything else when he sees you hurting. 
He immediately wants to go to that part and love it back into pure health. He loves us and paid a price for us. And we are grateful for him for doing that. So <coughs> today's Torah Parsha is talking about the uh, Kafar, Kafar uh, Aduma, the red heifer. And <coughs> Kafar Aduma. Uh, and it's one with timima, te without a splot or sickness or anything wrong with his body. But he sacrificed that for those who are unclean so that they could become clean. That's a wonderful picture of what the Messiah has done for us, isn't it? Yeah. Ashir Ain Ba Mum. Of where in there is no blemish, no defect, no short limb or twisted limb. But it's in perfect good health and condition. And it says, which has never came upon a, a yoke has never come upon her. Well, they used to use their cows to pull their uh, wagons. And they put a yoke on the calves in order to make it easier on the calf so that they can more comfortably pull their load. And this this calf has never had a wagon attached to her. She doesn't have to have. Uh, she's not supposed to have ever been selected for that use. That's a picture of Messiah. Yeah. He was never, he never had to carry anybody's burdens when he was growing up. Never. And then, now that he's full size, he becomes the sacrifice for all of us. It's a beautiful analogy of the Messiah. We have... Um, I suppose you could say traded places with Messiah. He carried our burdens, which there was no no reason for him to be that kind, under that burden. But he became that burden just so we could be cleansed. Thinking about how much God loves us, he even chose his own son to be that burden carrier. His own child. Yeshua went through 30 some odd years, 35 years I guess, of no cause for a burden to come upon him and yet he took the ultimate burden for all of us. Somebody said, well, how can I know for sure that God really loves me that much? Well, just think about how much worse things could be. But they're not. Doesn't that tell you something? God gave us water from the rock in the wilderness. He told Moses, speak to the rock. This was in last week's Parsha. Was it last week or this week? Last week, yeah. I get to so busy studying them, I forget which one I'm on. <laughs> supposed to just speak to it. Why should he just speak to it? Why shouldn't he hit it? Well, because he's breaking prophecy. The rock is the Messiah. He, he was told to strike it the first time, and out would come living water. And he did that, and it watered all of the animals of Israel. Over nine, you know, uh, well, uh, 1.6 million people walking through the wilderness. 
And not only the people needed water, but the animals needed water. And so Moses struck the rock according to God's instructions. <coughs> and here is a beautiful example of what strange fire is. Moses struck the rock the second time. He was not told to strike it. He was told to speak to the rock. And that the rock would willingly give its water for the people of Israel. And so Moses struck the rock a second time when he was uh, uh, feeling sorry for himself. <laughs> what do you want me to do? Strike this rock and bring water from it? So he struck the rock. But you see, God didn't say strike the rock again. He said, speak to it. Why? Because the rock has already paid the price. And it doesn't need to be struck again. Because it will do it willingly, without force. So the perfect picture of prophecy was broken when Moses struck it the second time. Did it bring forth water? Oh, yeah. But was God's heart broken over it? Yeah. Why? Because he didn't have to strike it again. All he had to do was speak to it. Just let the rock know what you want. But people today are too big a hurry for God to do what they're asking. And then they strike the rock again because they're impatient or because they've got pressure on them to perform. Mm -hmm. Oh, but if I don't get this rock to bring forth its water, then nobody will believe that it can happen. Mm -hmm. Well, they won't believe it anymore anyway because it's, it's supposed to deliver water just by being politely asked. Mm -hmm. So we've got to learn our lessons and not ruin God's plan. When I was younger, I worked at uh, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City. And there was a guy there who was an atheist. And he said, uh, if God is God, if he's really a God, then he could make a rock that is so big he couldn't pick it up. And then uh, if, if he can make a rock that's too big to pick up, for even for him, then he's not a god. So he's thinking in his logical human way of thinking that he's got God in a box. Mm -hmm. I said, mm -hmm. why should God do anything for you? Just because he can doesn't mean he's going to. Just because you are in a wrong spirit and wanting to disprove him, he's not going to satisfy your request. He's much smarter than you and much bigger than you. So anyway, that just was so far out <laughs> to think in those ways. I couldn't even think in those ways because God is full of compassion and mercy and love. And he provided the way to him by his own sacrifice of his own son, which he also loved. And he gave his son the ultimate task of bringing all of us close to him. I can't think in those illogical terms of the atheist. You have to have a really corrupted mind to be an atheist. If you're an atheist, you need to think about it. What's important to you? Do you do things that are important for you and your family? Or do you do trivial things for you and your family? If it's a trivial thing, why would you do it? doesn't prove anything. So 
So God gave us this sign that he is going to cleanse us by providing a perfectly solid red heifer with no off-color hairs in its coat at all. And he provided that so that we could be cleansed from our mess-ups. Are things that we accidentally do or out of ignorance. He cares about those things. And it's up to us to be um, appreciative of the things that he gives us. Mm-hmm. Um. When you were asking about what does the red heifer sig symbolizes also uh, in continuation from the Torah class, I also thought that because the red heifer was a female, it's a picture of, um, a r you know, the birthing of the children of Israel, you know, birthing of those who are coming in covenant with y Yahweh through Yeshua. Mm -hmm. And so there's a connection that I had seen about That's that. That's interesting, yeah. That's yeah. good. So, this red calf is supposed to be given to Eleazar, the Alazar, um, the priest, the Cohen, that it, he may bring forth uh, without the camp, bring her forth without the camp, uh, and one shall slay her before his face. The priest doesn't slay her. Somebody else does that. And um, Eliezer shall take the blood with his finger and sprinkle it directly before the tabernacle of the congregation as the appointments, the meeting place. And of her blood seven times, and one shall burn the heifer in his sight as the priest watches on, b b bring the, burn the heifer, her skin, her flesh, and her blood. With her dung, he shall burn it. The priest shall take the wood of cedar and hyssop and Shani, Shani, Tolaat, a scarlet, and cast it into the midst of the burning heifer. Then shall he, the priest shall wash his clothes, and he shall bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards he shall come into the camp and shall be unclean, the priest will do this, until evening. And he that burns her shall wash his clothes in water and bathe his flesh in, flesh in water and shall be unclean until evening. Even though he's done all of this already for purification, he doesn't actually become clean until the sun sets on that day. Right. He shall gather up the, the man that is clean will gather up the ashes of the heifer and lay them without the camp in a place clean, which is clean to whore, and it shall be for the congregation, the children of Israel, uh, to be kept for water of separation. Now, the separation is the word nida. Where do we know that word from? Nida. Where does it come from? What is it? It's the uh, feminine cycle. 
Well, that's the women's time of month when yes. they're unclean. Yes. So this is for a water of nida, a separation. Hatat heave. It is for atonement, a sacrifice, a, a sin sacrifice. Purification for sin. Did you know you become sin just by being female? What? I'm sorry. Just by being born a woman, you are, you are unclean. Just by being a born woman. As a woman, you're unclean. The nida is what cleanses. When you come into nida, the Bible says you are being cleansed of your impurities. There's a lot in this in the Hebrew. Yeah. You don't see any of that in the English. Uh-huh. But it makes sense when you hear it that uh, the Nida is what separates you. God commands you not to join with the rest of the children of Israel when you're in Nida. It's the thing that separates us. And then once the Nida is completed... Then you have to immerse yourself in water and follow the b biblical mandates and you become clean along with the rest of Israel. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And he that gathers the ashes of the heifer, his clothes, and be unclean until... Evening, and it shall be unto the children of Israel, uh, and to the stranger of the that sojourns betochem um, in your midst for a statute forever. It says, he that touches any dead body of a man shall be unclean seven days. And he that shall, let me just open this up in English. It's easier to put it together where it makes sense to you. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, will be unclean for seven days. He must purify himself with these ashes on, on the third and seventh days. He will be clean. But if he does not purify himself the third and seventh days, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches a corpse, no matter whose dead body it is, and does not purify himself, has defiled the tabernacle of Yahweh. That person will be cut off from Israel because the water for purification was not sprinkled on him. He will be unclean. <coughs> Anyone who touches a corpse, wait a minute. And, oh, is, he will be unclean. His uncleanness is still on him. This is the law when a person dies in a tent. Everyone who enters the tent and everything in the tent will be unclean for seven days. Every open container without a cover closely attached is unclean. Also, whoever is in an open field and touches a corpse, whether of someone killed by a weapon or of someone died naturally or the bone of a person or a grave, will be unclean for seven days. For the unclean person, they are to take some of the ashes of the animal burned for, as a purification from sin and add them to fresh water in a container. A clean person is to take a bunch of hyssop. That would be like a lavender bush. <coughs> add, the, add them to fresh water in a container. A clean person is to take a bunch of hyssop leaves, dip it in the water, and sprinkle it on the tent, on all the containers, on all the people who were there, and on the person who touched the bone, or the person killed, or the one who died naturally, or the grave. The clean person will sprinkle the unclean person on third and seventh days, 
And so it takes a clean person who has already been clean to sprinkle the water of purification on the one who's unclean. And then on the third and the seventh days, on the seventh day, he will be purified. He, He will purify himself and then he will wash his clothes and himself in water and he will be clean at evening. The person who remains unclean does not purify himself. He will be cut off from the community because he has defiled the sanctuary of Yahweh. You think God is serious about this? Yes. Absolutely is. This is to be a permanent recu- regulation for them. The person who sprinkles the water for purification is to wash his clothes. Whoever touches the water for purification will be unclean until evening. Even if they were clean, if they touch the water of purification, they will be unclean. Until uh, they will be unclean, and anyone who touches him will be unclean until evening. Well, it's, uh, it's something that spreads. It's contagious. Yeah. <laughs> Uncleanness is contagious. Well, we've got a lot of this kind of uh, reading that we need to do today, so I'll leave the rest of this for the sermon time. Mm -hmm. But I remember the story of Yeshua walking through the streets of, I think it was in Jerusalem, and a leper came up to him, touched the hem of his garment, and Yeshua turned to him and said, Tell no one how you became clean, because... If he did, doing so would cause man's screwed up knowledge to judge him for having touched someone who was clean and bringing uncleanness upon him. But Yeshua is the source of all cleanness, and so therefore uh, he can't follow the normal rules of clean and uncleanness. He doesn't have to because he's the son of God. He's the sacrificed lamb that takes away the sins of the world. What is the time of of Nidah in a woman, it's a time of the purification for the woman, that she is purified from her transgressions. By being born a woman, she was born in sin. And that's why the rabbis teach that a woman who is born of a, a human being is born in sin. Because she is coming into a mother who is going to bleed for a while, as in her Nidah. And so this, these things all tie together. And it's almost just too big for the mind to comprehend it all. But God comprehends it all. It, it started with uh, in, the, in the Garden of Eden. Yes. That's where it started. Garden of Eden. A woman who is in Nidah, even though she may never have broken a commandment, she is still regarded as though she was unclean because she is in her impurity. So we can't help but being in an unclean state just by being born, no matter whether you're a male or a female. Because the woman has to bleed in order to bring forth a child. And so the man then, even even though he be a man, he is born in his mother's uh, impurity. So how much more so would the Gentiles need to be cleansed? They need the water purification too. So all of these things seem so interconnected and so interrelated that we can't conceive in our mind how it all works. We can't even begin to fathom it. It's way beyond us. That's why the rabbis say that Yahweh is... uh, Ain't so. Not comprehensible. It's beyond our even our own comprehension. He's ain't so... 
if you have ever touched anybody who has been cleansed by the water of purification, you just touch someone who's unknowable. Because <laughs> it doesn't make sense. We're either all born in a state of sin or we're not. Well, that solves an age-old question. And the question is? <laughs> yeah. Is it innate within us to be born of sin or not? Or do we learn how sin? It's just the way of life. It's the way of life. The way of life is death. I heard a professor one time in college tell, me, tell us that uh, from the time that a baby is born, born it begins to die yeah. and that it continues through life until it hits the point of death and it's true yeah. who can know the end of it well god does yeah. anything the unclean person touches will be unclean and anyone who touches him will be unclean until evening. So even if this person is a Jew who has been uh, taught all the laws of God and they're walk, walking in those laws of God, they have to perform the ritual for cleansing or they're still unclean. When you think about an, a newborn baby, he comes out of, putrefying, smelly mess that's the byproduct of her womb and is stinky and it's all bloody looking and the first thing they do is they they take the baby and scrub it. So they used to scrub them in salt. I don't know what they do now, but salt was supposed to be a universal um, cleansing agent. And so <coughs> that's the first thing they do. Well, they have to clip the umbilical cord, of course. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, until that cord is clipped, the baby is still in contact with death. And um, the uh, presence of defilement. So is all this interesting? Mm -hmm. I never could understand why the re rabbi said that uh, every person who is born is born in sin. That didn't make sense to me. My parents have been trying to keep his commandments all, all along, and they're doing the best they possibly can do. So why do you say that if they are in sin? Because when I am born, I'm born unclean with the blood of the mother on me, all over me. And then I have to be cleansed before I can be clean. <laughs> Just like a doctor, when he comes in to help to deliver a baby, the first thing he does is he scrub his hands. Mm -hmm. And the second thing he does is scrub his hands some more. <laughs> Why? And that's to keep uh, cross-contaminating all the germs and blood that's on other people so that they are not uh, transmuted to the ba baby. Mm -hmm. See, God is the one that makes all these rules. He's the one that makes it all uh, work. And he knows that just being born naturally here in this world causes us to be as in a state of sin. And how can a sinner do miraculous works? Well, he can't unless he's come in contact with Almighty God. How does he come in contact with Almighty God? Through Yeshua the Son. That's how he comes in contact with him. And once he has come in contact with, with uh, the Son of God, then he is cleansed of all of his uncleanliness 
and that makes it possible for him then to um, be close to God and to be able to work miracles. It's really amazing things when you get mm -hmm. to studying it. I think I'm going to hold off on the rest of this part of the class because we're going to be reading through this during the sermon. And there will be a lot more that you'll see that comes uh, comes out of all of this. Um, when Yeshua died, what came out of him first? Oh, when they pierced him? When they pierced him in the side with his blood soap. and water, blood first and followed by water, mm -hmm. and what's that a sign of? Uh, isn't that also purification? That's a part of Nidai, isn't it? Separation yeah. of the blood and the water. Yeah. And so, <coughs> was Yeshua clean at the point in time when he died? Anybody? The answer back here is no. Okay. Why do you think he was not clean? Can you show me chapter and verse, please? <laughs> Open up your mic. Where it says that Yeshua, Jesus, was unclean at his death. Well, <coughs> the scriptures, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry. And it was uh, you know, just a moment of learning to me again on the board. Um, so chapter and verse would be, um, I want to say it was Matthew 23 in context, and then Luke uh, 8. Uh, so I don't know if we have time to reference those scriptures, but... To answer your question w as to where the context for my conclusion to the answer no, that's where I was pulling from. Now, maybe I'm looking at that in context in a way that's different than the point you're, you're aiming to get across, and maybe I'm wrong, but um, that's what comes to mind at this moment. I'm going to try to get a Bible open here. There's a little differences here between the complete Jewish Bible and the uh, Christian versions. Look in Jeremiah chapter 31, starting in verse 31. Behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. I will put my laws in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahweh, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquities and their sins I will remember no more. I will forgive their iniquities. And then we have to go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 
going to just drop down a little ways here, and I'm just going to read some of this. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by people, but chosen by God and precious to him, you yourselves as living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be kohanim, set apart for God to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to him through Yeshua the Messiah. This is why the Tanakh says, look, I'm laying in thee on a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone. Whoever rests his trust on it will <coughs> certainly not be ashamed, certainly not be humiliated. Now to you who keep trusting, he is precious, but to those who are not trusting, the very stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Also, he is a stone that will make people stumble, a rock over which they will trip. They are stumbling at the word and disobeying it as it have been play, as has been planned. But you are chosen people, the kings, the to Kohanim, a holy nation, a people for God to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You were once not a people, but <clears throat> now you are God's people. Before you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And then I want to show you uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter um, 52, I think. <coughs> That's going to be chapter 53. I'm going the wrong way here. Okay, it's, it's chapter 53. This is a very strongly messianic prof prophecy. Even the Orthodox will tell you it is. Orthodox Jews will tell you that this is a messianic prophecy. And uh, yeah. The anti-Messiah missionaries will use this scripture against believers. Yes. It, is, uh, it was our diseases he bore. Our pains from which he suffered. Yet we regarded him as punished, stricken, and afflicted by God. But he was wounded because of our crimes. Crushed because of our sins. The disciplining that makes us whole fell on him. By his bruises we were healed. Do you understand? He took upon himself our sins, our sicknesses, our diseases. The punishment for our crimes. And that's what Messiah Yeshua did for us. So as we consider the purposes of the Messiah and Almighty God as he is looking at us, yes, he sees us as being born in sin. Yes, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And it's Yeshua's cleansing that he gives us when we accept his mercy and his sacrifice, and it cleanses us from all of our uncleanness. I'll show you this again in the Brihada Shah. Um, let's see, this is going to be uh, First John. 
and it's going to be chapter 1, and we'll just look down a ways here. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with <coughs> Let me get back on track here. which was untaught and unstable, which untaught and unstable people have twisted to their own destruction as they do also the rest of the scriptures. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, we be beware lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. To him be the glory. That which was from the beginning we have seen. I've got to see where I'm at here. Here it is. <coughs> if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Chapter 2. My little children, these things are writing to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua the right, Yeshua Messiah, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him. By this, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected by in him. By this, we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought to also walk just as he walked. So the whole point is that Yeshua himself becomes the propitiation or the uh, arrangement agreeable by the court for paying our price of sin debtedness. Propitiation. Powerful word. Oh. All I can say is, glory be almighty God, Yahweh, who is the God of all, of, of Jew and Gentile alike, and may his grace and mercy be upon us all. And Yeshua the Messiah, who he provided as the lamb, just like he provided a lamb for Abraham's son, Isaac, so that he would not have to die uh, as called upon by God and that the lamb was provided for him so that he wouldn't have to die. 
he became the the propitiation for the sins of Abraham and his whole kind. So that's amazing. Well, if anybody has any questions on this subject, please write me on asktherabbi at tzion.org, and we will try to answer your questions. Amen? Amen. Quick and if that didn't generate some questions, nothing will. Well, I have a quick question. Check your pulse. Are you, do you <laughs> have a heart? Is your heart beating <laughs> in your chest? You can feel it in your neck right there, right below the right jawbone. You can feel your heart beating if it's working. And if it's got a pulse there, then you need to answer, ask your questions because this makes plenty <laughs> of questions to answer. I have a quick question, Rabbi. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Somewhere in the Brit Hadashah it says that... Uh, if anyone who has rejected the Messiah, then, and uh, says that they were they were really not part of them, part of the, the people. Like, is it you know to say that they accepted him, but then they rejected him, then they really weren't, really part of the vine. Yeah, it's like Yeshua said, if they left us, they were never of us. Exactly. <coughs> so how how I I can't even comprehend to even think of deserting yeah messiah <coughs> everybody <laughs> waits for dessert <laughs> <laughs> but then how <coughs> how does how does one even how, how does that come about i mean if they didn't really truly believe in the messiah they just never tasted tiramisu <laughs> <laughs> okay okay <laughs> If they've ever tasted tiramisu, they would not yeah. leave before dessert was served. <laughs> well, was it because, you know, was it a not proper instruction or identifying who really the Messiah was initially? Well, there's a lot of complications that have developed uh, in history. Uh -huh. Number one is that the rabbis have worked so hard to hide who the Messiah is that the people just ha cannot believe that Yeshua is indeed the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They've told a lot of different kinds of lies and twisted scripture in order to make it sound like Yeshua is not the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And that's not their fault. I don't believe God will cause that to become at fault uh, when the end of this age comes and we see Mashiach. Everybody will know who he is. Everybody will know that they were deceived. Yeah. And it'll be time for growing up time to admit it and quit it. Repentance time. Amen. Well, I, th I, th I think it has to do a lot with uh, the Hellenization and, uh, you know, the, the exile from Spain and, and, every th and, f and from the land. You know, uh, are people being forced to, to convert? Mm -hmm. Or they'll, you know, how they say, burn in hell, or they'll die. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's a s that's a sad thing. I, I really, <coughs> you know, that I I think that's uh, the a real core issue, and that's why um, a lot of what has developed to turn aw turn people away from Messiah is a reason for it. Well, I'll tell you the the statement that if you don't accept Jesus. You're going to burn in hell. Yeah. That is not Jewish. No. Jews don't even believe in hell, the concept of being totally annihilated and destroyed in hell. Right. It's or not a theological issue for Jews. Or that they're burning. Right. Their yeah. souls are burning. Eternal torment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-uh. So, well, how are we supposed to get Jews to accept Jesus then? By just telling them the truth. That Yeshua the Messiah is, was, and always shall be the true Messiah. Uh-huh. Period. That was and is. And shall ever, uh, yeah. ever be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, man. Well, just like with many of us, we have to overcome our hurts and pains. And, and let the word of the truth divide what is... Mm -hmm. Uncle, you know, untrue and not. Okay. I'm just uh, telling my staff it's time for us to proceed on to the next part of our service. 
I hope you enjoyed the teaching this morning. And if you want to learn how to show that Yeshua is the Messiah to your Jewish friends, I can show you that, but I want to know that you really, really want to know and that you're not going to use this to try to convert them into Christians. Because Christians are paganized, Greek, twisted uh, elements of the of truth, what's in the New Testament. But you only take a few little pieces of the truth and you mix it with a whole bunch of lies, and it's still lies. So just uh, try not to twist the hearts of Jews that they have to leave Judaism to be saved. It's not true. It's a lie of the devil. I guess that's it for the moment. Go ahead and uh, uh, take it to the next part. Shalom, shalom.